Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. Do you do a lot of education in dentistry? I hope you do. And if you do, you're always wondering, how do these great minds work? Well, today we're going to go right into how these great minds work with two of the best educators in all of dentistry, Dr. John Coyce and Dr. Christian Coachman. We're going to ask the question, what does it take to be a great teacher? So Christian, I would love for you to introduce our amazing guest today. Yes, great, great pleasure and honor. Um, everybody that knows me knows how much big of a fan I am from John and how much I I try to become a teacher like John. And uh, it is he is the mentor of the mentors, um, somebody that devoted his life to education in our profession and still today does it with so much passion and intensity. Uh, people think that I've been teaching for too long. Imagine, uh, John, I don't know how many more decades, uh, you know, uh, but I hope that you, John, will stay forever teaching. Uh, that's like a dream because uh, we need you so much. And you teach on some of the topics that I love the most. You teach us how to think, how to think the process, uh, not ready solutions, but how uh, to do risk assessment, how to do diagnostics, how to do treatment planning, uh, what I believe are the most challenging areas of dentistry. And one of the reasons why I, I love so much these topics, first, because my dad is a, so passionate about these things, but because uh, I learned from U.S. educators like John, the importance of these topics. So for me, it's a great honor to be here. And I've been, of course, interacting with John for the last decade here and there, uh, but this is a unique opportunity because I'm here just asking questions and I can ask questions that I never had the chance to ask before. So, John, thank you for uh, giving us your precious time here and allowing us to interview you. I'm sure it's going to be amazing. And uh, if you can just say hello to our listeners so we can start. Well, greetings, everybody. Uh, Christian, I can't thank you enough for such a, a beautiful and gracious introduction, especially uh, knowing you as I do. That's all from the heart. Uh, I was really looking forward to this opportunity because whenever we're together in any capacity, uh, something happens. And so I learn from you as well. And, you know, when I learn from people like yourself, it, it helps me grow in ways I never imagined I could grow. So I always look for these opportunities. Thank you. This already shows us one of your, maybe, if you may allow me to guess, one of your main skills here is this beautiful beginner's mind. You know, you know almost everything in dentistry. And every time I meet you, you're always behaving as if you didn't know more than anybody else and always open curious about how to learn more is that well, correct yeah i think it's interesting i i feel that it's important to maintain a childlike curiosity to continue to grow uh, i always want to be better tomorrow than i was today and so i i used to talk to my graduate students when they finished their program and they really did some amazing cases uh my comment would be i hope you just finished your worst work and <laughs> look at me like i'm crazy but the <laughs> idea is if you don't think you could get better i don't think you can maintain a passion i don't think you would continue to strive for excellence and moving moving the needle as far as you can it's and the way I think about it, it's not a competitive excellence with other people. It's an internal excellence just to be better than yourself. And, you know, the famous idea, you can't do better unless you know better. That would be the idea. <laughs> it, oh. that, that, it, Kirk. Yes. Would you tell us a little bit of the background, John? So how do you know, give us the origin of how this all came to fruition for you how did you did sure. you know you wanted to be an educator how did this happen for you yeah i don't i don't necessarily have a classic tipping point that this all occurred but i can tell you when i was in college i 
I was thinking about three different career options. One, back then, long time ago, I worked for a subsidiary of IBM, and that's when it was key punch cards and machines that took up rooms. Uh, <laughs> so I thought I would be in computers. Uh, I also uh, thought about dentistry. And the third actually was teaching and education. I, I really enjoyed the conquest and I thought maybe that would be my career path. I chose dentistry and found a way to maybe put all three of them together today, ironically. And, and I feel very grateful for that, that opportunity. My real, um, I would say transition point in education happened in graduate school when we were asked to provide a lecture, um, to put a continuing education program together. And I really, really enjoyed that. I really enjoy taking people from a beginning point to an end point and figure out how to close all the missing spaces that I call continuous logic and build it like a movie or build mm -hmm. it like a story. And hopefully when the conclusion happens, it it reaffirms a, a lot of the different arenas that you covered during the program. So I really enjoyed that opportunity. Yeah. So you, when you were in college already, you had that feeling for education. You say you were even thinking about pursuing this as a career. Uh, were you already a great communicator? Were you good at communication more than your friends, you know, as you were growing up or... No, I actually had no idea, to be honest. I never thought of myself as a great communicator, so thank you for that. Um, I just try to talk to people like I prefer to be talked to myself. Uh, I also try to always handle people with respect and dignity, and I really enjoy questions. I, I tell people that come to the center it's perfectly okay to disagree, it's just not okay to be disagreeable. And then maybe we can grow together. And that's been also a tenant of mine in terms of creating a safe atmosphere for people to could be able to confide in things, maybe what they're concerned about, because I really believe that educating the heart without education Educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. Mm -hmm. When you were starting, yeah, when you were starting with it, John, who were your favorite? Who influenced you along the way? Because uh, obviously, yeah, you know, I'll, I that I can answer very specifically. When I went to University of Pennsylvania, there were two people that was seemed godlike to me, and that was Morton Amsterdam and D. Walter Cohen, and. Uh, I learned so much from them. I, I learned about their confidence in managing patients and people, um, their ability to also continue to push the envelope of what we learned. I, I felt that my role would become trying to be more of a game changer than what I call an expert regurgitator. I'm not mm -hmm. interested in repackaging what other people have already done. I'm always trying to think, how can I be better? You know, because it started uh, actually for my own insecurities. Uh, when I finished graduate school and suddenly I entered the dental world really uh, in another way and my fees were higher, I felt I didn't deserve them. Why should I charge more money if, if my outcome isn't better? And so trying to continue to improve, not just in what I believed I was doing, but in actual physical survival probability of the work and the outcome for patients. Then it became much more compelling for me. You know, one of the models at the center is when you're in practice, the phone should only ring for two reasons. Uh, reason number one is new patients because that's the growth arena of the practice. And reason number two is praise. If the phone rings for anything else, don't answer it. Yeah. It's bad. <laughs> so that was, that was really helpful to me. 
to create a, a very continuous uh, learning system. So the center is built not as courses, it's built as a curriculum. It's a graduate program for practicing dentists and all the courses relate. And as you mentioned, Christian, you know, mm -hmm. my favorite topics um, are what you talk about a lot, even when you're lecturing. Uh, you bring certainly all the new technology, many of the things that creates maybe a new life to these topics. But there are three things. The three things I think about are the risk assessment, being able to make decisions, and even regarding single teeth, you know, I, I find many times dentistry or dentists uh, feel almost embarrassed or uncomfortable uh, because they say, I'm a single tooth dentist, I'm a bread and butter dentist. But, you know, I believe that single tooth dentistry doesn't mean simple minded dentistry. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of thought that goes into restoring each tooth every single day. And I want to make sure we capitalize on that. So decisions uh, mm -hmm. are key for me. And that's that risk assessment model. Mm -hmm. Second is figuring out where teeth go in the face. And the third is how to make the teeth fit together and function properly. And if you could do those three things, you're sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, products come and go. Uh, systems somewhat continue to evolve but those are the three key things that would keep us sustainable mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now many people ask me christian how do you get confident on stage you know do ha do you have you done courses professional courses on communication etc and my, my answer is probably very similar to what you would say john you know one way to become a better communicator is just be so confident about what you're talking and and know that you are very good at that topic. And that's how, because I was shy. I was a very shy adult. And I was never extroverted and people think that I am and I'm not. And I realized that my protection was, I'm going to know about this more than anybody can know about this in a way that I will just go up and beat my shyness and beat my, my unconfidence through know-how. I know how to do this. And it looks like that's more or less how you build your communication career. Yeah, right? you know, I never quite thought about it that way. I've always admired your ability as a communicator, and it's certainly that confidence level goes through, shows through. But it's it's interesting. Most of the time, when I'm with people, I'm not the same person that I am at the podium. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and it has a lot to do with maybe what you're thinking, what you're echoing. I try to be prepared. I try to be confident in understanding the science as best I can and willing to challenge it and to actually enjoy doing that. And, and I think that's what tries to drive me the most mm -hmm. and in, in doing so. I try to communicate it as clearly as I can. Maybe I'm not always as effective as I'd like to be, but I kind of appreciate what you're saying. It does has to have to come from some inherent confidence that comes from a level of preparedness. Yeah. yeah. So you talk a lot about risk assessment. Actually, I learned that this term with you, uh, risk assessment, you know, uh, and I, I usually say, you know, the biggest problem in dentistry is the volume of bad decisions that dentists are doing. For me, that's the number one biggest problem. And, and I try to talk about how technology can help people see better and make better decisions. So my lectures nowadays are almost a full day on how technology can help you make better decisions. And that comes from me being inspired by you talking so much about risk assessment that at the end of the day you you mentioned is about making better decisions right so if you could talk a little bit about risk assessment how do you define this how do you summarize this what are the one two three little things that uh we could learn from you about risk assess the importance and how to become better yeah that's an interesting question uh and it's a pretty big topic to unpack <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let me take a little quick run at it. You know, one of the barriers 
to understanding risk assessment is to think that we're good enough and to think that there's not better ways of doing things that improve our outcome. And I've certainly been in this long enough that I've seen even things that I created, uh, things that I've been very passionate about to become obsolete. And as we do that, and we have to continue to move toward paradigm shifts, disruptive, innovative technology that's happened in our lifetime, which is quite frankly happening at the speed of thought, which is almost unsettling. You know, mm -hmm. in 2016, there was an article published uh, that stated there's an article coming out every 23 minutes in dentistry, and that's in 2016. <laughs> and now I'm sure it's it's much faster than that. Yes. Yep. So when I first started, I learned from people that had been doing things for 30 years. Now it's hard to learn from people that are doing something for even 30 minutes <laughs> uh, because everybody's doing something what they believe is the cutting edge, but does it stand the test of time? And I, mm -hmm. I really became very enamored with embracing the data. And I would say the whole idea in risk assessment is, is understanding what science is really saying, mm -hmm. uh, because it's very easy to make mistakes, even when we think the science is reasonably good. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've tried to stay as true to the science as possible and use it as my crutch mm -hmm. to help me make better decisions rather than my opinions. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. because and, for me rooted in science is a, always the best way to go and and, and even though we know that uh, the fundamentals and uh, you know being rooted in science these this is the, the the foundation of making better decisions a clinical experience you know um having some years of experience doing things over and over again uh knowing the information about diagnosis and treatment planning uh all of these has nothing to do with technology. These are things that you need regardless of yeah, technology. Yeah, if I could make a comment on that, I think our, the challenge for us is being enamored by what would be considered a surrogate endpoint, not a true endpoint. And for example, if you're trying to decide on something as basic as what's the best sodium fluoride varnish to use on the teeth? You know, you can read an article about which particular varnish has the best fluoride release, but but that doesn't really make the decision. The decision, mm -hmm. the end point, does it actually reduce the disease we know as caries? Mm -hmm. So it's it's hard sometimes when dentists are not focused on the true end point and get diluted by a surrogate endpoint. It, mm -hmm. it makes it very easy to dupe the real reasons that we are using the product to begin with. Mm -hmm. Now, even though, you know, technology by itself will not allow people to make better decisions, uh, lately, I know that you are such an open person that you've been very open for technology as well. And oh, you've been sure. testing and trying and, and, and you are somebody that people don't naturally see you as an expert on digital, but I know that you are more of an expert in digital than many people that are teaching about digital. Uh, and and I would easily come back to you to ask you about digital, even though people think I'm an expert on digital. So my question is, how much digital is actually helping you make better decisions? Nowadays. Well, it's interesting, you know, we have a, a whole digital arm of the center now with Marta here as our director of uh, digital dentistry, because She's I amazing. saw that yeah. as our future. She is amazing. Uh, yeah. I don't know another person that has more uh, passion about digital dentistry and the future that that brings than she does. Uh, and it's helped me. Uh, kind of work we work together almost as the yin and the yang between analog and digital and analog and digital and and i would say one of the things that you can see with digital 
maybe I'll make a simple example as photography. Uh, when I started, it was slides, and I had to wait a week until they were developed so I can revisit them. Well, now it's instantaneous, and I can look at something and learn from that at the moment, in the moment, mm -hmm. and not after the fact. And it's changing as I'm evolving mm -hmm. because that feedback that I get from the digital technology is exceptional that I never had before in the analog world. I mean, you know, you can make an impression, but you can't see the result of it until it's poured and said and separated. But now it's instant on the screen with an iOS and so on. So there's so many things that that feedback is in the moment. And I was never able to practice in the moment quite like that before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you speed up the learning curve. Yes, absolutely. You actually, what I see here happening with us is that you 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 shorten drastically the distance between the moment you made the decision and the outcome that that decision generated. Absolutely. You bring these two points like together and, and it, of course, allows you to learn with every bad decision, average decision, good decision. And, and of course, you start to make better decisions. Imagine that, uh, you know, we, 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 treat, we help dentists treatment plan their uh, ortho treatments, for example, their aligners, right? So we are constantly guiding people on uh, to biomechanically develop a better strategy. But the doctors are treating the patients and scanning the outcome and sending us back the outcome. And we are overlapping that outcome with the series of decisions that we made in the software before ortho, right? So you see before ortho, you remember all your decisions, biomechanical decisions, and then you see the outcome and you start to learn. And imagine if you, if you do that 1000 times per year, you can only become an amazing expert on biomechanics, right? Yeah, you know, Matthew Syed calls that black box thinking. It's a fantastic book that I recommend for everyone. And the idea is to bring as many objective things into our daily decision making as possible, because otherwise we were relying on subjective or embellishments or feelings, what people believed. And that's why we've moved from eminence based learning to evidence based learning. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. very important that we stay on that track. And I've learned so much with objective data that it's really changed how I make everyday decisions. And, mm -hmm. and I think this is the whole piece now with AI, because AI is not only uh, allowing us to do this, but it's allowing us to now recapture that information in a way that's now usable you know, whether it's a chat yeah. bot or yeah. whatever. So, so do you agree that people should not only take advantage of digital to execute something right here, right now better, but people should not miss the opportunity to revisit the outcomes and compare with their decisions through digital. You know, I see that people are not usually leveraging this. You know, they, they are excited about using technology to do that thing right here, right now uh, with technology but missing the opportunity to compare outcomes with decision-making and learning through technology. Yeah, you know, I started a long time ago, actually with Align, um, when it was iTero, mm -hmm. um, for, about the use of the technology, let's just take a scanner for diagnosis and treatment planning, not just to, to make things or build things, whether it's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. liners or crown and bridge. And so that was very early in my vision of what we could do with that. And we're here at the center, we're working so hard to build a virtual patient because I really believe that chair time is so precious. You're yep. spending a lot of time, a dentist yep. can't afford to collect all the data that's necessary to make the decisions. If we don't take advantage of the technology, uh, we'll get buried. What what got us here yeah. is not going to get us there. So yeah. we're going to get buried. Yeah. Can I ask you about that, John? You've seen, we're talking about education. People always say dental education has changed. 
Can you comment on that? And then also, how has the student changed over time? How have students evolved? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, one of the things, uh, we did start the meeting a bit about education. I think what's changed my trajectory in ed education is working in smaller settings because what I rely on is the feedback that the dentists provide when I'm with them. Uh, because when they come up and ask me questions, I realize that I've created gaps because you never know where dentists are in their journey in development. I, I mean, here at the center, I, I have a dentist that has maybe been out less than a year and another dentist been practicing for over 45 years. And it's a different level that we're trying to uh, relate to. And based on what your past experiences are, what their training was before they came, and so the gaps I find are growing because the information is so vast. You know, what I think is happening is dentists have to realize maybe three things in their education journey. Uh, and it's called the three levels of learning. Uh, level number one is about information. Information is cheap. You can Google it. It's not that e that difficult, and a lot of younger folks certainly have access to that level technology. Level number two goes beyond information to knowledge, and and well, first of all, information is free, right? You could Google it. Knowledge mm -hmm. is cheap, right? But knowledge depends on accumulating a lot of the different types of information streams that you're getting, but the real key is getting to the third level of understanding, which is wisdom, because wisdom is priceless. And you yep. can't get wisdom unless you understand how to manage all the things that is are coming into your brain on an everyday basis. And it's it's unbelievable to start to put the pieces together and I enjoy looking at teaching, like helping people put together a puzzle. The difference is it's no longer a jigsaw puzzle, it's a Rubik's cube, because it's mm -hmm. all three-dimensional thinking and very challenging. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the key for me. Absolutely. And, Go ahead, Christian. And how, how do you see the younger gen generation of dentists coming to you? Do you, you know, we see many older dentists complaining that the young dentists are not as excited or are not as committed or are uh, want everything easy in their hands. I, I'm not saying I agree with that, but I, I see many older dentists usually complaining on the process of trying to find young associates, right? Yeah, How do you see I guess I, I've heard that also. I, I've not experienced quite that, mm -hmm. that trend. Either. Maybe I'm very fortunate in what comes to the center. Uh, I would say it this way. I find the younger dentists are incredibly motivated, incredibly passionate, uh, because what, what really uh, creates opportunities for the dentists that come here, it's about pride and being proud of what you've done. And I find no difference in younger dentists wanting that than even seasoned professionals. That's number one. Now, I would say, like all of us, like whether it's my grandchildren, even my sons, I mean, every generation has a different, as, uh, different access to technology. And what I would say that is common is in the younger dentists, uh, things are happening faster for them. Uh, it's very easy for them to be bored. They're constantly stimulated. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy as a teacher to always create that level of engagement um, because people aren't as patient, right? I mean, you make a phone call and there's a delay in how long it takes for it to ring for three seconds and you're ready to throw the phone against the wall. I have to tell people, listen, that's going to space and back. You could wait a few extra seconds. So maybe we can kind of re 
rethink that. But my point is, I do find them incredibly passionate mm -hmm. and incredibly frustrating that they realize, even after dental school, how much more there really is to learn, mm -hmm. to create mm -hmm. mastery. You know, because you started talking about confidence on the podium. The goal is to create the confidence at the chair. Mm -hmm. And that's when this when the folks come as a student, they're really a clinician and they want to feel confident in talking to patients and talking about the things that they do and why they do them at, at a level that's uh, much more compelling mm -hmm. for patients to understand. And I, I think that's what I can hopefully provide as an educator. And and how, how many people coming to you also want to become educators? How many people ask you for help in that environment as well? Um, well, uh, I would say that I'm not sure if I created that or if they had that inside them. In other words, when I was in the Air Force, I spent nine years in the Air Force and I spent uh, one of my duty stations, I was treating pilots. And I was always enamored because they all seemed the same mentality, you know, and you have to have a mentality like they had to be a fighter pilot. And I wondered, did the Air Force build that or instill that? Or was there something inherent in the people that wanted to be a, pilot, a fighter pilot to begin with? I think it's a little of both. And so I, I think we, we have that fighter pilot mentality in all of us, and we just have to bring it out. And I think that's possible. Yeah. That's what I enjoy, that security that people get. Yeah, and I'll piggyback on that, Christian. I think that's a great question. And, John, I could say this about you and Christian. I mean, it's less about teaching for me. When I watch the two of you, real leaders, the mark that they make is they create other leaders, whether it includes teaching or not. You know, John, the people that come from the Koi Center, they're they're not a little passionate. They're extremely passionate about the world that they create. Same thing with DSD. So I, I, it's very powerful to watch the legacy both of you have put on this great profession. Yeah, you know, I, I always believe you to be really confident. You also have to feel good about yourself. And we get beat down in this profession quite a bit by so many of the negative things that we can spend time talking about that I think isn't going to go anywhere. But the point is, I, I think, to capitalize on the good things and let them override the other things so they're overshadowed is what I've chosen as my path. And and, and how important is the tribe? That's the way Kois people call themselves. I'm part of a tribe. Yes. And that for me is beautiful because it shows that is beyond dentistry. It shows that, I don't know, intentionally or non-intentionally, you created a movement and creating a movement is an art. Uh, you can be uh, extremely knowledgeable. You can be a great speaker. You can be a great CEO. You can run an amazing company, but that doesn't mean you have a movement behind you. Having a movement is something extremely special and more powerful than anything else. So how did you see this happening around the Koi Center, around you? Uh, well, it goes back to things on tribal leadership and what that is. And the problem is um, many organizations, the actual philosophy of the organization goes back to I'm great and you're not. And mm -hmm. it's people talking more about themselves than maybe what they could do to help other people. So the idea in the tribal relationship is how we can help each other to make our life better and to have a higher purpose. And I know it sounds kind of unusual, but I really actually believe that. And I feel mm -hmm. that the reason we try to feel the tribe part is for people that have your back and people that could really help you to become better than yourself or better than you could and on your own. And I think if we could even accomplish that in some small way, uh, it may be even bigger than actually working on 
on teeth or just doing dentistry. And, and mm -hmm. people tell me one of the things they gain coming to the center is more than just the dental background, more it's it's about their life and how mm -hmm. to improve everybody's life. That's the idea, making everybody better. Yeah. John, I want to ask you a question that I'm just curious about. You've written an incredible book with your legacy on this profession. What's the next chapter? Can you give us a peek, sneak peek of what well, do you want to do next? You know, it's funny you ask me about the next chapter because most people are asking me, when am I going to retire? <laughs> so, uh, and, and I don't have I started that. I started saying that we hope you will never retire. Yes, you right. did. You did. I was very, very flattered by that and encouraged by that. It's funny, you know, as I'm as I'm growing, I feel like now I'm improving exponentially because I have access to so many more things and so many more brilliant people. And as we chatted about Christian in the beginning, uh, we get to a point where a person could say one small thing that just explodes in your brain to open up uh, huge opportunities. So to answer the question, I'm excited to uh, really move the needle again and change it with technology. And we have so many thoughts here at the center between introducing uh, a chat bot for education and introducing so many things to help improve the uptake of this vast amount of content that we're all trying to absorb. And what I find is as the concerns for how much we're trying to learn, it almost is very frustrating uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, when I first started, I look back when dentistry seemed more complex, it was amalgam versus composite. How do you put on a matrix band, <laughs> gold crown or a metal ceramic crown? It's, it's so different today. So it is much more complicated, but I find it exciting. You know, uh, when I finished dental school, there were three things I learned, not risk assessment, teeth in the face, and how to make them fit together. It was more about you had to just keep the plaque off the teeth, put them in centric relation, and give people a night guard. <laughs> those three things, everything should be fine. And that's not the case. I mean, really? <laughs> Does everybody think it's that easy? I don't think so. so. It made dentistry, the more I learned, the more excited I became. And the more excited I became, the more passionate I became. And that's really what continues to drive me. Because what drives me is not what I know, but what I still don't know, mm -hmm. uh, but willing to learn. And, and what is the future of the Koi Center? I see that, uh, you know, your your kids are involved. You know, of course, I know Johnny. I, I, I worked with Johnny in different occasions. And, and, and Dean is also uh, doing some work there with you. Um, now I see uh, you maybe officializing other collaborators in the team. Uh, how do you see the evolution of the Koi Center? You know, you one of the major things uh, for me that made Koi Center so amazing was always the fact that it was always you. I, I knew that if I would go there, you were not thinking commercially how to expand. You were not, uh, you know, hiring people to give lectures and just show at the beginning and show at the end. Uh, you were there. If there was a five-day course... John Coyce would be there five days teaching that course. Uh, but now I see you bringing amazing people like Marta, for example. Uh, how do you see this evolution? Do you see the, the, the center? Yeah, you, you, that's always the challenge from the original legacy or the heritage of the center. But what I'm doing are bringing people that have expertise that I don't have. So I could assemble the parts a little bit differently and make the make the whole even greater. So the, the future now is how to continue to improve 
using even some of the minds of other people without hurting the legacy of what made the center what it is today. So I, I don't, uh, I truly continue to believe that I have the common thread that maybe would be the glue for the center, but I tend to want to rely on other people that could bring new things to the center, new levels of expertise, new levels of, of content that we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm so excited about to grow the center to the next level. Mm -hmm. And, and what, one more question, uh, you, you know, from all the modules that you give, the lectures that you give in your programs, you know, you probably have some modules that have been around for many, many years, you know, the, the occlusion one or something like that, you know, the, the topics and lectures that you've been giving for, I don't know, maybe 20 years or more, very similar. How do you wake up in the morning and still have the passion to give this lecture, you know, uh, people ask me this question and I've been doing the DSD course for 10 years. I ask you the question, you know, how do you keep your passion on teaching yeah. some of the basics and fundamentals? You know, it's funny. It's a question that I, I typically even get asked by the students. Uh, but my answer is, is first of all, no course is ever the same. Yep. Uh, I'm not teaching from a static manual. Um, the the content has to have a little bit of spontaneous opportunity created by the interaction of the students that come. Mm -hmm. but something happens to me when I get on the podium. I I just become in the moment, if you will, and I'm sure you could feel the same thing, regardless of how I felt. It's no different than a dentist. You could be tired or uninspired, but once you sit down at the chair, something comes over you and it's that feeling that continues to drive me. And as long as that feeling continues to exist, I can't stop. So that's the exciting part. Fantastic. Love it. Love it. Now, I know I would like to keep you for another hour, but you're a very, very busy man. Give us some both fun. I know some people that are going to be listening to this are going to want to know more about the Koi Center. We're going to do that after that, but... Um, maybe John, give us some final thoughts to think about. And then Christian, you also. Final thoughts. No. <laughs> On education, the future uh, of education, you know. Well, um, I, I think the future of education, uh, it's pretty amazing, you know, the opportunities now we have with different media options and the ability to engage in so many ways. Uh, I think what we're working hard on is creating a, a level of engagement that is second to none. And that's the piece that we constantly are researching and trying to work through because there's some kind of blend between the mind and the body and how people engage. And so we see it in the courses because as the courses progress, it's palpable what happens later in the week as people get to know each other, feel comfortable with each other. There's a level of engagement that starts happening actually in the latter part of the courses when people would normally be the most tired. It's when the excitement comes. So what we're trying to do is figure out how we can best maintain that level of excitement um, with different options for people because what we begin to realize is people learn differently. Some people are more visual learners and uh, people like to learn in, at different rates and so on. So I think that's our big part of the future, trying to figure out how we could use technology. We're using maybe with the idea of working with headsets and virtual learning and all these kinds of new things that we're working hard to see how we could perfect for education. And my, my last question is, what would you say to a young adult that is about to decide of starting dentistry, doing dental school or not? 
how would you present our profession to this person in doubt? How would you explain the possible expectations or things that they could expect from our profession? Uh, well, number one, I still think the profession is amazing. I think it's only continuing to become more amazing with new technology because we're beginning to actually use the technology to help us understand more, see more, our ability to track the data. So I have no reservations about moving in a career path for dentistry. My recommendations is once somebody finishes dental school, the sooner you find people to be surrounded by that you respect to help mentor you. And that doesn't always mean you have to work together, but just people to have somebody that you could ask a question to, uh, somebody that could help your growth, uh, because we all face with the survival needs when we start entering practice. I, I remember actually when I first started my practice, I hated it. I really hated it. Every patient was a new patient. I didn't know if you would stay with me. I paid all this money. The debt service was was heavy. I was in a survival mode. My first year in practice, my adjusted gross income was zero. My second year, I still made less than a hygienist. Uh, but I was still confident. You know, we all have to have the growth mentality or what people call the success mentality. And it's just like a, a gold medal figure skater has fallen 20,000 times before they win the gold. You, you have to be ready for that. And I had to work on that because I took some of the negative things in practice early as very personal without understanding, without people to help me really see beyond that. I think the sooner that somebody can get to that level, the, the happier they'll be. Because I do see, unfortunately, some of the younger dentists that are excited but not so happy. And mm -hmm. I, I think being happy about this and passionate about this is is what really is going to happen for everybody because the, the, you can make a living. That's not the problem. It's being passionate and making work and play to love what you do. That's the key. So well said. Christian, give us some final thoughts. And then, Dr. Koyce, I want you to tell our listeners where they can go to learn more about the Koyce Center. Now, let's just have Koyce giving the the information that I think is key. I, I think that for me, uh, a, a normal question that I always ask when I meet a dentist is, uh, first, do you know John Coyce? Of course, if they say no, I don't even waste time talking about dentistry with them. That's what my kids <laughs> <Same>. would say. <laughs> That's what and, my family would say. Uh, and then second is, uh, did you take his courses? You know, if if the person no, I, I'm a Coyce alumni, then the conversation, uh, it's almost guaranteed that, uh, you know, the conversation will be great. So it's almost like a stamp, a stamp, a quality stamp in dentistry. So it's a must investment. You you have to do this yeah, course. I appreciate that because any of the supporters that have been through the center, if somebody that they're talking to uh, maybe have a difference of opinion, they'll say, have you ever actually been to the center? Have you actually heard the whole rationale for why this is this way or this is this way? And that answer will be a no. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Kirk, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to, promote, to promote the center, but it's always a little bit embarrassing because it's a little bit self-indulging. So I, I would say it's very easy. Just Google on the Koi Center and tune into the website. <laughs> That's... Well, I'll help you, John. I, I, if I'm I, looking I, at the I, website, where do I start? If I, if I want to learn more, what would be the first course? Course, that... uh, course 165. 165. Course. Yeah. We, uh, you know, we went to the, the bigger courses. We're looking for all committed people and that's proven very, very good for us. And I, I've really been blessed with wonderful, wonderful people to a T. I, I get everybody saying they love the people that are in the room with them. And they love learning with the people that have been here. So uh, for me, uh, I'm very thankful. And it's a tribute to all the people that have been here. 
um, because together they make a wonderful group of people that other people want to be around. So it's, it becomes not just about me uh, bec becoming about more about the people you want to surround yourself by. That's that's how Christian and I got to know each other, right? From that first day in the restorative academy in the back yes. of the room when you gave your first yes. lecture. Yes, uh, I remember I, that day. Yeah, I have I have I have to finish Kirk with this story. It's just Please. a few seconds, you know. It's imagine me, super young, uh, Brazilian. Even though I was a dentist, I was known as a technician, and I say this because as a technician, you always have a secondary position. Unfortunately, you know. Uh, related to dentists. So I'm a young Brazilian technician uh, speaking for the first time in an important Congress, maybe the most difficult Congress event to speak, to lecture, the Restorative Academy in Chicago. I tell people, you know, <laughs> you better be ready because you're going to see all the most important faces looking at you and saying, is it worth my time, right? Uh, and I'm there and and they give you a very short time to it's almost like a TED talk yeah i think it was like 15 minutes lecture 20 minutes lecture something like that and i give my first important lecture in the most difficult congress event academy in the world and i finish people clap nothing special everybody leaves and you have that huge as a young person question mark in your brain you know did i do a good job you know did i mess up maybe i did mess up this is nonsense why did i do this blah 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 and as i come down the stage you know uh people nobody said hello nobody complimented me but one person and this is this man he comes to me john coys comes to me shakes my hand and says with a very honest true smile uh you did a great job congratulations i really enjoy it well it was it was easy. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it means the whole thing. You know, I'm I'm sure that uh, uh, other people enjoyed and, and nobody came to talk to me. They, nobody, you know, you know, needed to talk to me. They were so important. Everybody sitting there was so important. And John came to me without even knowing me, shook my hands and, and said those words that I still remember today. Thank you. So powerful. So... Gentlemen, I, John, I could keep you for another hour. And Christian, I know you have a ton of more questions and maybe we'll have you back for a follow-up episode, but I can't thank you both enough for what you've done the profession and being on here and sharing your wisdom today. So thank you. This amazing. was really fun. When yeah. We, we'll so see you another session. <laughs> yes. So stick around while we say goodbye to all the listeners, but Hey, thank you guys for showing up for the best practices show. If you enjoyed today, which I know you did do us a favor, hit the share button. And if you're not taking notes, this is how it works. Flip up to the notes and Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you're consuming this podcast, and you're going to see links to the Koi center and what uh, John was mentioning. And you can click right on the link. It'll take you right to the website where you can check out course 165. And I'm just going to tell you, take it. Don't think about it. Just do it. You'll be glad you did. And it'll change your life. It'll change your team's life. It'll change your patient's life. So until we see you guys next time or you hear from us next time, keep watching or keep listening to the best practices show. You guys enjoy your day.